Hi, my name is Aaron Eiler and I'm the uh, creator of the Aftermath Data uh, mobile application as well as service that I wanted to go ahead and explain to everybody to help everybody get the big picture of what we're doing and then dive into some of the details of the app itself. So I created an outline here to walk you through and the first thing I want to do is give you a bit of the backstory. Uh, this all started when I was sitting on the sofa watching uh, Hurricane Harvey news footage and I saw footage of the Cajun Navy cruising down the highway and I knew at some point the Cajun Navy uh, was going to be ineffective in certain ways because because they didn't have information that they needed as far as where to go and how to deploy the resources that they had. So I looked at it and said, how am I going to start helping to solve this particular problem? Well, turns out I'm a Marine and I've got a background in beans, bullets, and band-aids, i.e. logistics. And you know, you start to think about how do we solve those particular types of problems. And I thought about the different ways of communication uh, that are utilized today, radios, cell phones, the internet, things like that. And it dawned on me that you know, really we have to go to the smartphone because everybody's on a smartphone. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about cell phone technology in a minute, but you know, it seemed like that some way via the smartphone we could come up with a way to connect people to the need and those that had the resources to help. And how can we facilitate all that? So, um, you know, I've been in Florida for 35 years. Uh, I've gone out and done hurricane relief myself. Uh, I understand some of those challenges. I took a trip down to Puerto Rico just recently to really spend more time with the NGOs, the non-government organizations, and work with them to try to understand what their challenges are and what they're saying about the information that they're able to get or not get that hold them back from being able to do the things that everybody wants to be able to do, which is help those that are that are down and out because of a disaster. So uh, I learned a lot of great information from the folks down there. The other thing that I learned is that there's a continuum of a disaster. Now, these aren't official terms, you know, issued by FEMA, but there is a situation which I call level zero. Level zero is the event just happened, there are no communications, power's out, and nobody can do anything but help the neighbor. And you go outside, you look around, you see where there's a problem, you walk over to your neighbor and you help. You can't pick up the phone, you can't get on the internet, nobody's had time to get to you yet and ask you about what's going on in your area and what kind of help you need. That's level zero. But quickly after level zero, and quickly is a relative term by the way, we know that Puerto Rico uh, four or five months later is still without uh, cell phone and power in many, many uh, areas. So. You know, communications need to come back online. And in Puerto Rico and recent disasters, we saw a lot more innovation from the cellular companies and other companies that recognize the, the importance of getting communications back up, particularly smartphone communications, because that's how America and the world communicates today. So, um, you know, level one is where I see communication starting to come back online. And that's where, you know, we really uh, felt like we could start to be effective. You know, we're not a, a ham radio operator network or anything like that. We have to have certain tools, but the tools that limit us are the same tools that limit everybody and the average citizen. So when those services are restored, then we become effective in what we're trying to do. You know, during the storm, there was an app called Zello that came out, and I downloaded it too because I heard about it, and it was it was you know going viral in social media. So I, I said, I don't understand this because I'm in the GPS vehicle tracking business first and foremost. So I understand cellular communication, data communication, things like that. And Zello came out, and so this is some kind of miracle app. So I installed and kind of got a feel for it. And you know, Zello is great in in certain applications, but what you need to understand is you have voice communication and you have data communication. And they travel on two different parts of the connection that you're used to getting on your smartphone that just allows you to communicate. So when the voice communication is down because too many people are trying to talk on it or the cell carriers actually throttle it or prioritize government agencies over the civilian population, then maybe all you have left is data. But when the tower is down, you may not have either one. And if you don't have either one, you know, Zello and these other uh, applications that are being marketed out there aren't going to work either. You know, if you're able to communicate via Bluetooth, we know Bluetooth is very short range, so it'd be like using a walkie talkie in your house from one room to the other. If your phone was able to create a Wi Fi hotspot and you were able to communicate over that Wi Fi hotspot, 
you're still talking about ranges that are so short that they're inconsequential in a disaster or an emergency situation. So, you know, uh, understanding that is hugely important. There are groups out there that are looking at what's called mesh network technology. We saw cell phone uh, uh, you know, technology being floated up in hot air balloons. They're talking about having drones on station flying over to provide connectivity. So there's a lot of more innovation going on because cellular communication is how you're going to save lives and how you're going to coordinate in disasters in today's day and age. So uh, very important to understand that concept. And you know, just to reiterate, when cell phone service is down, we're down just like everybody else. So. Uh, understand that there are limitations to technology and sometimes you just got to walk outside and you got to look around and you got to decide this is what I need to do to go help somebody and you walk over and do it. So in starting to think through this idea, you know, we had to think about this in phases and the first phase is preparation. And what are some of the things that we can do to help people before the storm? We've uh, really learned from Maria in Puerto Rico that a three-day supply of anything is not good enough, especially if you're not on the mainland of the United States or you're not connected to a large body of land that might be around other countries. Uh, because getting large amounts of supplies to an island is a huge problem uh, logistically, very, very expensive. So in the preparation phase, you know, we have sandbag centers, we have uh, permanent shelters that are opening up, and we need to know where they are. And the problem that I saw at this particular point is that information scattered all over the place. Uh, you know, Hillsborough County might have a website where they talk about shelters. City of Tampa might have something. Manatee County has something. Uh, FEMA has something. The state uh, FEMA group has something as well. And because of that, it becomes very convoluted as to how or what information is available and, and how to get it. So that was a problem that we were looking at. The second thing is what resources are available from those different facilities. And whether it be a shelter, uh, an aid location, which might be like a sandbag facility, or even your local home store, you know, where plywood may be in short supply as you're trying to board up your house. Um, having information on that level before the storm helps you move much more efficiently uh, in preparation for the storm. Uh, next is what types of problems are there in the current system today? Now I've been reading a lot and studying a lot and talking to a lot of people. Uh, I've been working through social media to understand more about where the problems lie. And one of the things that I saw was lack of accountability. And lack of accountability is a it's a system problem at this point. And we think we have a way to solve that and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, number two is lack of information. Uh, that information prevents us from having a feedback loop which every uh, manager, leader, uh, commander of a battlefield needs is information coming back called a battlefield assessment uh, in the service, right? So we need that information to come back, uh, BDA actually. Uh, we need that information to come back so we can then determine whether or not the things that we're doing are effective. Uh, the next thing is slow and inefficient information. So. If, you know, if we think something's happening, but it's been eight hours since a problem has been identified, that problem may be resolved, which means we may send resources to a place that no longer needs them, or somebody may have died. And a great example of this, unfortunately, is the elderly people in South Florida. And there was absolutely no reason for that. Uh, the problem was you had young people, inexperienced, lack of communication, and no clear way to you know, gain assistance. And they were left out there on their own to work through these problems when technology today should have prevented that from happening. Um, so you know, we have the slow and inefficient response. The other thing that I saw with the slow and inefficient response is that uh, information is coming in through human beings. And when I pick up the phone in a disaster, i.e. Irma blows through and knocks out my neighborhood, I've got every other neighbor in the neighborhood trying to get the same information out there. And when I have to contact 911, if I can get through, that's great, but that 911 operator then has to take that information, put it into a system, and that system then has to feed official government responders who then will prioritize that information and get to you as soon as possible. That whole process is inefficient. It's very limited in the volume at which uh, it can be handled. If you have a major hurricane like uh, Maria come through Dade County, Florida, your 911 center is done. 
just not going to be able to handle the volume. So how do we collect information and process that information very quickly and efficiently in a way um, that we can get people what they need in order to respond and start providing aid very quickly. Okay, So we wanted to develop a solution that delivered the right data at the right time. And the importance of data can't be understated. Uh, whether we're justifying a request for you know, water filters, solar panels, um, the National Guard units to go into these particular areas, whatever the situation is, data only reinforces the needs that we've identified through word of mouth, through you know, someone visiting out there, maybe a police car rode through a neighborhood and brings that information back. That's great, but if I have data that tells me what's going on in that area and I can quantify that, it's very much easier as a commander or a decision maker to understand what assets I need to allocate. So getting the right data at the right time is hugely important. Next is when we think about the continuum, we talk about level zero, level one, and when level one starts to come back online or is online, we have some level of communication, we have people, NGOs or non-government organizations, we have volunteer search and rescue teams, we have people that are standing by ready to go and help people, whether it be through a, a trained certification process uh, that are really well qualified to handle certain types of disasters, whether it be a mountain rescue of an av uh, avalanche, or it could be a flood situation, it could be wildfires, or it could be hurricanes. This isn't just about hurricanes, this is about every disaster and emergency that's out there that's of some scale. So. Uh, we had to figure out how do we enable these groups and these individuals to get there because they're typically the first ones to arrive on scene. So uh, we have these uh, SARS, NGOs, National Guards. We need to get them information in real time that they can look at and say, I'm qualified to go handle that. I got it. I'm driving over there. or I'm going to walk over there. Or I'm going to hike over there. I'm going to ride my snowmobile over there and I'm going to effect a rescue or I'm going to be first on site and I'm going to provide some aid and comfort until somebody more qualified can get there or we can get some transportation to get somebody uh, out of a dangerous situation. So uh, we want to enable the lowest level of, of rescuer possible. Now as uh, logistics start to flow and resources start to become available and the number of emergencies drop, then you know we start to shift from everyday citizen responders to focusing those emergencies on those that are trained and qualified, so the SARS, the NGOs, and then we leave the most critical life and death scenarios to the uh, you know, fire and EMS guys that will handle you know, advanced life support and advanced rescue techniques. Next is we need to find a way to match that demand uh, with the resources. So we talked about SARS, NGOs, National Guard, whatever, but we have to understand what resources they bring. And if you have a canine search and rescue team, you don't necessarily want to send them to a, you know, uh, a situation where maybe it's a, a flood. You know, dogs aren't going to operate so well in six feet of water. They can swim and smell and they're great. But maybe that's not the best resource. Maybe I've got an NGO that has a high lift pickup truck that can drive through four feet of water and we can just match the demand for someone that's standing on their roof to somebody that has this truck or a John boat or an air boat or whatever and, and say, hey, you need to go over there. We're gonna assign you to this flooded area and you need to effect rescues based on your initiative that we identified earlier and the skills and the resources that you bring to the table. You need to go there and operate and do your best. And that's what we're counting on is that professional best and initiative to save a lot of lives early on in a disaster situation. The next thing is the data-driven uh, data decisions. We talked about this and in the service we talk about painting the picture of the battlefield. The battlefield that we experience in a disaster is exactly that. It's the large areas of chaos and destruction and we need to work as a citizen group to recognize that in order for good decisions to be made, we have to participate in the process of collecting and providing information. And we'll talk about how we felt that we have solved that problem, or at least contributed to the resolution of that particular problem when we start to actually go through uh, the aftermath service. Uh, a good example of 
of what data can do and, and how we can get the right information at the right time comes out of California. I was watching the news and there was a sheriff uh, in California where the wildfires were going crazy and they have an alert system out there and the sheriff stood on national news and said we had we have the ability to send an alert but we couldn't send it because we were going to notify the entire county versus notifying the neighborhood that got burned down at 3 a.m. in the morning. So the people in that neighborhood had no shot of being uh, contacted as this wildfire was you know, moving at 50, 60 miles an hour and it just burned through the neighborhood and you know, I don't remember if anybody died, hopefully not, but um, if we have the right data and the right tools, we can do very focused alerts to people that are in that particular area and we can get the right decision information to the managers to release those types of alerts to the people that are in greatest need. And then they can give feedback based on what actually transpired. We got out of here, I had to leave some horses behind, you know, can we send somebody back out to check on the horses, whatever those cases are. So uh, just one of many examples of how having good data and communications uh, improves the response and the uh, saving of lives in these disaster situations. So now what we're going to do, I'm going to take a quick break, I'm going to clean the board up and then we're going to actually look at the solution and how we've attacked it and why, the, why this solution has particular benefits.